Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. I am Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Tuesday, February 27th, 2024. Tonight, I'm very excited about this webinar. It's one of my favorite broadcasts to do. It's on James Hollis's book, The Eden Project, In Search of the Magical Other. I think, in my opinion, I, I, I think this is the, the best, most informative book on coupleship, on intimate relationships with a partner. Um, I think it's it's thick and dense in the sense that he uses a, a lot of pretty high level psychological terminology, and you'll get that out of some of the quotes tonight. Um, but it's a it's it's a it's a hit. It's right in the center of the target about the work that is involved in coupling and uncoupling and the conflicts and everything that that goes on within an intimate couple. Before I get into that, I just want to make my announcement on the upcoming events. We have one spot left. If in the last minute. You're up for it. You've been to Finding You. We have one Returning to You spot left, March 6th through 10th. That's next Wednesday it starts. Uh, this is the sequel to Finding You. So if, if you want to come back to do some more of your work, to reconnect to yourself, this is the place to do it. I love these. These are pe for people who have had some experience in the work, who have a foundation. So this is it's fun to work with people who are far along in the process. I really look forward to it. And I also want to make a pitch for one other thing our online finding you. We have an online finding you available. And when we started this during the pandemic, I was skeptical. I, I did not know if we could accomplish the same kind of process online through a screen that we could in person. And after my first running of the online finding you, I said to my team, we're gonna do this throughout the pandemic. And if this pandemic ever ends, we're going to keep doing it. And we've kept doing it. I love it. It's half the time, a third of the cost. You don't have to travel. It happens over a weekend. So if time and getting away from work and money and those resources are all at a premium for you, this is a wonderful option, a wonderful offering. So we online finding you March 8th through 10th. And of course, there are upcoming sessions after that. So let's get into the content of this evening. Years ago, in the context of a business relationship with business partners, we went to a marriage therapist. We were having conflict. We went to a marriage therapist who had experience in, in consulting businesses, but also had a degree in marriage and family therapy. So he brought with him that background. And in the first session, I remember he asked all of us, all of us being therapists, three of us being marriage and family therapists. He asked us the question, what's your responsibility in your marriage? And of course, this wasn't the first time we had thought of such a question. So we all had very academic, articulate answers to what we thought the role of a person in marriage was. And he said to us, after listening to all of our answers, he said, what if the responsibility that you had was to enjoy your spouse, to, en to enjoy, in this case, your partner in the relationship? If that were the answer, how are you doing at that job? And of course, at that time, we were all failing miserably at it, not really appreciating uh, our partner and, and their dilemma and what they brought to the table. And I thought about that question from 15, 20 years ago so many times over the course of my career in the context of marriage. And that's really what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about your responsibility. Now, I'm going to make this caveat one time, and I'm not going to say it again throughout the broadcast. If you're in a relationship that's abusive, that, that, that you have determined by your own means that it's abusive, you have all the permission in the world to get out of that relationship. So this comes, this, this idea about what we're talking about does not exclude that idea, that concept. I don't want people to hear when I talk about taking responsibility for your side of things and looking at your work, what you're contributing to the marriage. I don't want people to hear me saying that you can't leave a, a toxic or abusive relationship because by all means, you absolutely can. So let's get into it. Will Smith said this, this was pre-Oscar slap and it took a, it lost some of its meaning after the Oscar slap, but it's still a wise awareness. And I'm sure that what he was working through that night at the Oscars was part and parcel of this concept that he was working on. He said that he and his wife came to a point at, at one time in their marriage and they came to this idea. He said, whether or not a person is happy is utterly out of your control. We came into this false romantic concept that somehow we got married and that when we got married, that we'd become one. And that what we realized is that we were two completely separate people 
on two completely separate individual journeys and that we were choosing to walk our separate journeys together. But her happiness was her responsibility and my happiness was my responsibility. We decided that we were going to find our individual, internal, private, separate joy, and then we were going to present ourselves to the relationship and to each other already happy. And more simply put, he was stating this truth. It is not your job to make your partner happy. That's their job. And it's not their job to make you happy. That is your job. And when we don't take on that responsibility, when we abdicate our responsibility for, for living our life, for finding our meaning and our joy onto our others, no matter how romantic the culture says that idea is, we will find our relationship fraught with problems, resentments, hurt, and anger all the way through. I read an article many years ago called Why You Will Marry the Wrong Person, and it drew, drew the same conclusion from the New York Times. Compatibility is, is the achievement. Compatibility is an achievement of love. It must not be a precondition. I think there's this romantic idea that's pretty pervasive, if not ubiquitous, in our culture that your partner can make you happy, and that doesn't work. It can happen temporarily. That's the falling in love part, you know, the part where you can't eat. You can't sleep and you just feel full in the in the in the warmth of your your romantic partner's gaze, right? You feel everything you need to feel, but eventually those those processes break down over time. And for a marriage to be successful, I wrote, you must learn to fall in love not just with your partner's beauty, but with your partner's dilemma over and over again. And they must fall in love with yours. These are two incomplete people. Two imperfect human beings. And the best that you can hope for, Heinz Kohut, the analyst who, who was the, the, the father of self-psychology, said the mark of a good marriage is when only one of you goes crazy at a time. You, you have to understand that you both bring your baggage. And if you offload your baggage to the other and essentially ask your partner to do all the work of your healing, the marriage is going to eventually crumple under the strain of that pressure. Rilke said this, he said, I hold this to be the highest task of a bond between two people, that each should stand guard over the solitude of the other. How am I to withhold my soul that it may not impinge upon yours? There's this idea, and it's hard to talk about because it's paradoxical, at least in its language, that if you can't be alone, you're going to have a hard time with intimacy. The ability to be alone and happy in your own body by yourself is the precondition for successful intimacy. And if you're constantly fighting against the fear of abandonment, the fear that, that what happened to you as a child would happen to you again, that your, your parents failed in their ability to provide for you all their needs, as all parents do, all human parents do. And we, we buy into this fantasy early on in romantic marriage that, that, our partner is going to become our everything. They're going to become the home that we never had. They're going to give us the peace and the love that, that we so deserve that we've never had in our lives. So I'm going to be talking about the individual journey tonight and how the coming together of those two individual journeys can be problematic and what is the task for it to be successful. I love this quote by James Hollis from one of his other books, Finding meaning in the second half of life, he writes, the ultimate test of the family is not whether it provides safety and predictability, but whether or not to what degree each person can leave it freely and return freely as a larger person. When people come to me and they say divorce is not an option, I, I say to them, divorce has to be an option. Because if divorce isn't an option, then you're truly not choosing to stay marriage, married. You have to choose to stay married. You have to choose to stay in relationship for it to be love, for it to be meaningful, for it to be worthwhile for both partners. And if the option doesn't exist, then there's no choice involved. And, and, and one thing I know about divorce, and I'll say this throughout, is that if you're considering divorce, if it's getting to that point, the two thoughts I would share with you is the work is the same either way. Whether you stay married or get divorced, the work is the same because the work is your work. 
for you to become more conscious of your stuff, for you to understand what you bring to a marriage, what you contribute to the conflict, to, to the dilemmas, to, to your children and, and their issues. Just like Jung said, and I shared with you last week, parents must become conscious of, of the fact that they themselves are the, the, bear the primary responsibility for their children's neuroses. There is not an exception to that idea. We, uh, our quality of relationship is based on the happiness, the joy, the selfhood, the security that we bring to it. And because in all of us, those characteristics are limited, it's going to be work. And the relationship will, will expose all of those things over time. All of those things. So often, James Hollis writes, the, the idea of an individuation has been confused with self-indulgence or mere individualism. But what individuation more often asks of us is the surrender of the ego's agenda of security and emotional reinforcement in favor of humbling service to the soul's intent. That's a very poetic way of saying individuation isn't a self-focus to the point of, of exclusion of others. It is it is, individuation is the fundamental foundation of intimacy. The more secure you are in yourself, the more okay you are with yourself, the more you know yourself. And I'm not talking about the talented, beautiful, wonderful, successful parts. Those parts are pretty easy to know. But for so many of us, there's so little satisfaction in regarding those positive traits of ours because we know lurking in the background, under the bed, in the closet, are the parts of us that aren't beautiful, that aren't talented, that aren't accomplished, and aren't successful. And so our ability to, to deal with those things, not to avoid them, but to deal with those things will be the, 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 the basis on which the successful relationship rests. We have to come to terms with ourselves. Not who we want to be, not who we hope to be, not we who we aspire to be, not who we imagine to be. We have to come to terms with ourselves. And intimate relationships will ask you to deal with the parts of yourself that you have been avoiding your entire life, just like the parenting task does. I love this quote from J. Mike Fields, which says, there'll come a time when you will choose yourself, and this will begin the beginning. You have to do the work your work to become more conscious if you want to have any hope for a truly meaningful, long-lasting, beautiful marriage. Thich Nhat Hanh said, to love without knowing how to love wounds the person that we love. And I just love that idea. I, I, I cannot tell you, it is almost, it's almost every person tells me in relationship to a child, to a partner, they will say, I, I love them. And part of what we have to deconstruct and unravel and look at more closely is the way that the, what you were taught about love just isn't true. You have to learn, unlearn so many things from your family programming about intimacy, about connection, uh, about, about love in order to evolve to this, this higher, more, more conscious love that we're talking about today. That con said, be, despite how open, peaceful, and loving you attempt to be, people can only meet you as deeply as they've met themselves. I love the, the illusion that I sometimes hold on to, that I, I, I fantasize that I'm more evolved than my partner. I love that idea. Boy, that makes me feel really this, this wonderful, sweet, kind of holier-than-thou sense of myself. I love it. But the fact of the matter is, my wife is the perfect match for me. Every, every deficit in her, every limitation to her mental health, is the thing that I was attracted to in some way. Because you see, like most people, I, I fell in love and, and I could listen to her for hours. I could listen to her her anxiety, I could listen to her worries, to her frustrations, to her disappointments, to her insecurities, and I could just absolutely love them. 
And when I provided that for her, when I was in that early romantic phase of our relationship, the perfect parent for her, she would look at me with those beautiful big brown eyes. And I finally had cracked the code of my childhood that I could gain because of my, my wonderful talent of being a good therapist, a good pseudo parent for somebody. I could gain the admiration and love of the other person. And we called that temporary psychosis that I just described falling in love. And it was amazing until it wasn't. Until I got tired of being responsible for her peace and serenity. And she got resentful of my selfishness, of uh, my lack of empathy and caring. And then the chasm between us grew and grew and grew to the point that we separated. And during that, that crisis, that, that failure in our marriage, we, we both, maybe because of our background, maybe because of our training, maybe because we, we realized at some level, at some point during the separation, that there was no escaping ourselves for each of us, we decided to do the work and to eventually come back together and live our separate journeys together. Nobody likes feeling afraid, I wrote, anxious, hurt, or insecure. But here's the thing. If you don't feel and deal with those feelings, you will project them onto your partner and your children in the form of anger and criticism. You will fantasize and believe both with your children and with your partner, that they are the source of your unhappiness, of your discontent. Where if you have done the work to become more whole, to, to repair the, the attachment wounding of your childhood, the developmental trauma of how you were seen or not seen and how you responded to, if you heal that stuff, do the work of the soul, you become much more capable of seeing the other person and the dilemma, holding space for it, realizing, knowing it has nothing to do with you. It's not a denial of feelings. It's that it doesn't hurt anymore because of the work that you've done. Irving Elom, a, a very famous psychotherapist who's done a lot of writing, wrote a book called The Love's Ex Executioner, which I would not recommend. But I love this quote. In his opening pages, he writes, I do not like to work with patients who are in love. Perhaps it is because of envy. I too crave enchantment. Perhaps it is because love and psychotherapy are fundamentally incompatible. The good therapist fights darkness and seeks illumination, while romantic love is sustained by mystery and crumbles upon inspection. I hate to be love's executioner. And in some ways, I feel like that tonight. In some ways, James Hall's makes this, this point throughout his book, then when he's presenting these ideas, people think that he's taking the magic and, and the beauty out of love. I don't find that to be true. I think he's infusing into our, our psychology of coupleship, of marriage. I think he's infusing life into it, the kind of life that lasts forever for as long as we live, the kind of light life that, that, that is, is exposed under the light of day. Failure is important, unfortunately. Failure is necessary. One of the worst things that you can have for your spiritual gro uh, growth in your life is success throughout your life. You have to experience failure. And, and I, I, I want to teach this before I get into some more of Hollis's quotes because I think it's really, really important. It's not the mistake that matters. Mom and dad, husband and wife, partner, parent. It's not the mistake that matters. It's not the mistake that, that carves the deepest wound in our relationships. It's the defense against that mistake. The ego. The need to be good, to be right, to not be the bad guy, to not be imperfect. To not to have had bad intentions. What, whatever it is that is being defended. I wrote, and this could go for, for marriage too, what our children and partners may struggle with the most is our egos. For when their need to express hurt or anger comes up against our defenses, that is where the wound truly occurs. And just like we unconsciously shape our children so that they show us the parts of ourselves that are in need of healing, we pick partners that will expose 
the parts of ourselves that are unexplored, that are in need of healing. My daughter asked me not too long ago about what to look for in a partner. My youngest of four asked me. And I said to her the same thing I've said to my older children. I've said, look for someone who's willing to listen. Look for somebody who can be wrong. Look for somebody who's willing to be the bad one in a story. To admit a mistake, or in other words, be human. And furthermore, try to be this kind of partner yourself. So as we get into the Eden Project, I'm going to read some quotes to you. And I'm going to remind you at this point that anytime you want copies of these slides, we're happy to send them out. You can just ask for them, request them via our email address of at uh, the, the email address is webinar at evoketherapy.com. But here's the first quote, the first long quote from the Eden Project by James Hollis. If there's a single idea which permeates this essay, it is that the quality of all of our relationships is a direct function of our relationship to ourselves. Since much of our relationship to ourselves operates at an unconscious level, most of the drama and dynamics of our relationships to others and to the transcendent is an expression of our own personal psychology. The best thing that we can do for our relationships with others and with the transcendent then is to render our relationship to ourselves more conscious. This is not a narcissistic activity. In fact, it will prove, prove to be the most loving thing we can do for the other. The greatest gift to the others is our own best selves. Thus, paradoxically, if we are to serve the relationship well, we are obliged to affirm our individual journey. This is the work. This is the work in parenting. This is the work if you're a boss. This is the work if you're a coworker. This is the work if you're a romantic partner, if you're a friend. This work on, on understanding the relationship to yourself, which is really by extension, which really is a, a, a discovery, an uncovering of your childhood, how you were formed. This is the determining feature that will predict the quality of your intimate relationships, of all of your relationships. Become more conscious. Become more self-aware. Sit in a room and, and with somebody who can listen. Please, somebody who can listen. A therapist, a mentor. Somebody who takes on that role. And keep talking until you can see yourself clearly. Keep talking until you can figure out who and, and, and for what you need to apologize. Keep talking until you see your contribution to the, the marriage problem or the, the parenting problem or the relationship problem. James Hollis goes on to write, of the many projections possible, the most common are those onto the institutions of marriage, parenting, and career. Regarding marriage, he says, perhaps no other social contract has so much unconscious baggage imposed upon it. Few at the altar are conscious of the enormity of their expectations. No one would speak aloud the immense hopes. I'm counting on you to make my life meaningful. I am counting on you to always be there for me. I am counting on you to read my mind and anticipate all my needs. I am counting on you to bind my wounds and fulfill the deficits of my life. I am counting on you to complete me, to make me a whole person, to, the, to heal my stricken soul. Not only are these projections present in so many marriages, they are on the Hallmark cards that we give our loved ones at Valentine's Day. They are the, the, the euphemistic phrases that we use in our culture to describe romantic love. And they are, not sort of, not kind of, and this is not really metaphorical, they are psychotic and delusional. And we all have some of them. I do, you do. If you're listening, if you're breathing, you have these. Hollis goes on to say, only when one has suffered the collapse of projections onto the other or track the sim sim symptomology to its layer, may one begin to recognize that the enemy is within, that the other is not what he or she may seem, and that one is summoned to a deep personal accounting before one can begin to clear the terrain for true relationship. One does not come to such recognition easily without having suffered failure, shame, rage, or humiliation. But in such very states, it may be found the beginning of the insight to, one, insight to oneself, 
without which no lasting relationship may, may be achieved. That is the work. That is what the stress on a relationship calls. And even though one partner comes to couples therapy or to a couples intensive at Evoke with the idea that they want to work on intimacy and they want to work on communication and they want to hear each other, they have very little idea, most of them, of the enormity of the personal work that, that must be um, accounted for, that must be worked through in order to improve the relationship at a significant, at a significant level. Hollis says, so to be fantasized by the other, excuse me, so to be fascinated by the other is to be possessed by an affected idea. This is what happens in projection. In the most rabid stage of being in love, and rabid is by no means too strong of a word, one is unable to do other than obsess on the other. One is caught in a projective identification with the heart's desires. We see in the other person all that will save us. The boundaries between self and other dissolve again as they did for the infant. And then I wrote, romantic love is the discovery of a home that never was. And when the, when the projections fall away, as they must, the work for an enduring love begins. Accepting this journey, this invitation into self, James Hollis writes, accepting the journey obliges one to accept fear and to let go of our chief fantasies. We have to deal with the parts of ourself that we have avoided, that, that, that we think don't exist. And to do that, we have to walk through hellfire. We have to walk through shame. We have to walk through guilt. Hollis says in the Eden Project, all projection occurs unconsciously, of course. For the moment one observed, I have made a projection. One is already in the process of taking it back. More commonly, we only begin to reclaim our purchase on consciousness when the other fails to catch, hold, and reflect our, reflect our projection. If there is an essential law of the psyche, it is that what is unconscious will be projected. This is why it's observed that the quote to an inner situation is not made conscious. It happens outside his fate. But since the psychic, psych, the, the psyche consists of a multiple of split off shards of energy, uh, a complex of archetypal forms, virtually all of which are unconscious, there's always ample opportunity for projection. As I never know the unconscious by definition or practice, so I can never know what energies may be acting autonomously and casting, casting, uh, uh, casting onto the other person or, or to the world as I know it. Sorry, there were a lot of typos in that quote. I didn't proof that one very well. What he's saying here is that projection is inevitable and, and the work in marriage is to take it back, to start doing for yourself what you expected somebody else to do for you. He explains, nobody can live your life and you can't live anybody else's. And nobody else on earth is responsible for your peace and serenity than you. It's a fact of life. It's a fact of nature. It takes great courage, he writes, to ask this fundamental question. What am I asking of this other that I ought to be doing for myself? If, for example, I am asking the other to be mindful of my self-esteem, I have a project waiting unaddressed. If I'm expecting the other to be a good parent and take care of me, then I have not grown up. If I'm expecting the other to spare me the rigor and terror of living my own journey, then I have, then I have abdicated from the chief task and most worthy reason of my incarnation on this earth. Marriage is, requires courage. It requires boldness. It requires the ability to walk into fear, to, to confront the shame and the guilt that was handed to us by our context by, by our, our parents, by, by the, the, the soup that we grew up in, that we were cooked in. And you'll recognize this quote as one of my favorites. As Mahatma Gandhi once remarked, a coward is incapable of exhibiting love. It is the prerogative of the brave. Projection fusion going home is easy. 
Loving another's otherness is heroic. If we really love other as other, we have heroically taken on the responsibility for our own individuation and our own journey. And this heroism may properly be called love. And St. Augustine put it this way, love is just wanting the other to be. There is so much as Khalil Gibran, who wrote the prophet said, there is so much space in our togetherness that we don't know. See, we grew up thinking that we had to think the same, feel the same. We grew up with, with poor boundaries. We grew up that when our parents were upset, we thought it was our fault. From a very young age, most people believe that when parents are scared, upset, sad, grieving, that they, the child, are responsible for that. In essence, the child is the parent. The child is obliged in those moments to take on the responsibility of making sure that mother and father feel okay, feel safe, feel good. And what's more insidious than anything in this process is parents tell the child that that is love and that is connection. That is not that. That is an insidious pattern of mental illness that if we don't uncover and unravel it, will be played out in our intimate relationships and our partnerships. It's the exact opposite of love, in fact. The idea of soulmates. Hollis says, the, uh, the other great false idea that drives humankind is the fantasy of the magical other. The notion that there's one person out there who is right for us will make our lives work. A soulmate who will repair the ravages of our personal history. One who will be there for us, who will read our minds, know what we want, and meet those deepest needs. A good parent who will protect us from the suffering from suffering, and if we are lucky, spare us the perilous journey of individuation. Behind the search for the magical other lies the archetypal power of the parental imagos. Our first experience, this is what I was just teaching you, our first experience of ourselves in, in relationship to these primal others, usually mother or father. Consciousness itself arises out of the splitting of this primal participation, mystique, which characterizes the infant's sensibility. Uh, the 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 self for other and the transcendent and the transactions between are from these earliest experiences they are hardwired into the neurological and emotional network of our brains so here's the thing what he's saying is how you were shaped your relationship to your parents the the, the, the responsibility that you felt for their feelings part of it is is in our dna we are social creatures and without the tribe we will die we we are not very successful so it's built into us to seek connection for for survival so we come with that in our nervous system from the beginning but above and beyond that because of this this unexplored idea parents then make us responsible and that's why i, I teach so often when i'm teaching parenting that that parents should be very conscious of if or or when ever they share their feelings with their child to 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 try to get the child to feel responsible to go to your child who's addicted to drugs and say you're breaking my heart might seem like something that would spark their motivation but i would tell you that in many ways in many cases many many cases that's the problem they're medicating in the first place this overwhelming guilt and shame that comes from not living up to what their parents' needs are, to, to taking care of their parents. And when that shame and that guilt becomes so disabling, one of the ways to deal with it is through addictive behaviors and substances. It immediately gives an escape, a psychological escape from this prison that, that we have found ourselves in, to have failed the people that love us the most, the most, the people who tell us that they would do anything for us, the people who suggest in, in their sainthood that our needs come before theirs. It's incredible. Accepting the journey of, of, obliges one to accept fear and to let go of our cheap fantasies again. So why marry it all? Why not just go out and meditate? If we only meditated on the mountaintop, for the rest of our lives, we would end up talking to a ghost. 
Hollis suggests, by which I mean, he says, our own disembodied psychic fragments. While this sort of conversation with oneself must eventually occur, if you would undertake it without being painfully confronted with the otherness of the other. In other words, it will be exposed. These unhealed fragments of ourselves that are undealt with, that we are avoiding to deal with, will eventually come out in our relationships. That is the chief contribution of relationships to the process of individuation. Some years ago after reading this book, this is the third or fourth time I've read this book. I just read it recently, but some years ago after reading it, I, I said something that was meant to be humorous and I don't think it was well communicated in the context of the social media post that I made. And I, I was talking about how having children, having a marriage is, is one of the most painful things that we can have. One of the most difficult, heart-wrenching experiences that we can have. And at the same time, it's the pathway to enlightenment. It's the pathway to awareness. It's the pathway to consciousness. If we're willing to open our eyes and look inside. And by the way, if some of the things that I'm teaching you about what Hollis is saying, which I believe very clearly, and I think he would agree, are not his ideas for the first time. This has been well known for, for many, many years. He's just uh, incredible at articulating it and writing about it. If some of this news sounds really devastating to you, that's a good sign. If some of this seems offensive and non-romantic to you, I would offer to you that that's a really good sign. That is what it feels like when we're confronted with the things that we've been avoiding. It feels like an insult. It feels dark and hopeless and confusing. And one is left inevitably to ask the question, what now? This is devastating, horrible, dark news. What now? And I love this quote that I read today, that I read to you earlier today. There'll come, come a time when you will choose yourself and, and, and part of that choice is to look at yourself and that will be the beginning. That's the beginning of the work. So if you feel those feelings at all, that means that you're hearing me clearly. You're hearing Dr. Hollis clearly. I wrote in one of my books, because children are required to navigate their parents' defenses, to survive childhood, they develop in such a way that they end up relating to people who are the same shape, size, and color of their parents, metaphorically speaking. In other words, we become shaped by a certain kind of compromised person. And as we grow up, we are inclined to relate to those same kinds of people. The shape of our wounds predisposes us to fit with others who mirror, in some ways, our original contexts. The work, then, is to come to know this by unraveling our childhoods, good and bad, and everything in between, so that we can make friends with ourselves. And if we are lucky, we find a partner who is willing to travel a similar path that is their own. Who among us, Hollis offers, who among us can ever know ourselves well enough to be capable of agape, an expression of what might be oxymoronically call, what we might oxy oxymoronically call disinterested love. That is love wholly invested in the well-being of the other without the shadow of self-interest, cruising beneath the surface like a shark. We are looking for somebody to, to be the mother that we never had, and it is a setup in marriage. I've debated in my head over the years, like, if this is all true, you know, should we dispel the notion during the early phases of romantic love? And, and I've come to the answer that not completely. Not completely. But there, there is value in recognizing that all of the fractures, all of the fissures that seem invisible to the naked eye in the early phases of courtship will eventually, under stress and time, be exposed and become wider. In other words, if you come to me as, as a couple and you say our marriage is in a precarious place, I, I, I could say to you, I most likely wouldn't because it would be very unkind, but I could say to you, in essence, those were also the reasons that you fell in love with each other. That's what it means 
that'll be exposed. You choose something that's familiar. You choose something you recognize. You're essentially choosing your past in so many ways. We repeat these patterns in order to repair them. Hollis says, more often the pathology of the parent-child relationship is calling the shots. Who in their right mind would seek out someone and say, I want you to repeat my childhood wounding. I will love you because you are so familiar. Or Alice Miller says, when it doesn't, when that doesn't work, we have children to give us the unconditional love, love and sense of being okay. When the marriage starts to struggle, it's not uncommon for a parent then to start to use the child to meet their emotional needs. The great paradox of this individuation, this journey towards self is that we best serve intimate relations by coming sufficiently developed in ourselves that we do not need to feed off others. Or as my wise wife, Michelle Reedy said, for deeper connections, we, we don't constantly come to our relationships hungry. We come with full bellies, take responsibility for our own happiness and learn to find multiple sources of support. When we do these things, we are more capable of love and are able to attend to the needs of others rather than constantly asking the others to take care of us. Hollis is big on personal responsibility. He teaches us that the, the capacity for growth depends largely on one's ability to internalize and take responsibility. If we forever see our life as a problem caused by others, a problem to be solved, then no change can occur. Conversely, when we do our work, we change the frame from turning the other into something bad, nefarious, narcissistic, borderline, choose the insult. We change the frame from turning them into that to realizing that they're just simply a human being, a fallible human being. I wrote that I believe that the term soulmate is something that is earned, something that's earned through the daily lifelong work of the two people in it. We do our work and this is how we say to each other, I love you. By going to therapy, by listening to podcasts like this one, by reading books, by, by looking in a mirror long enough that we can see ourselves clearly. Joseph Campbell wrote, I think that one of the problems in marriage is that people don't realize what it is. They think it's a lifelong love affair and it isn't. Marriage has nothing to do with being happy. It has everything to do with being transformed. And when this transformation is realized, it is a magnificent experience. But you have to submit. You have to surrender. You have to yield. You have to give. You can't just dictate. And Hollis commenting on Campbell's comment said, transformation is about enlargement. And enlargement generally comes from suffering. Honesty isn't always harmonious. Intimacy doesn't feel warm and fuzzy. It usually feels terrifying, actually. It's usually very disturbing until we become practiced in it and at it. It requires the capacity to contain the other ones, to set aside our needs in, in a given moment, to be able to hear the person, truly hear the person. Like Jamie Gill says, we have to lose our minds in order to hear and see the other person clearly. It initially doesn't feel good at first. That's why often is the case. It can be any gender. It can be same gender. It can be any gender. Often the, is the case is the wife will bring the husband to therapy, to couples therapy, saying, I want to get to know him. I want to be, get, get to be closer with him. But then the question that needs to be asked of them is, are you ready to listen to his anger without defense? Are you ready to listen to his disappointments in the relationship? to his hurts that, that have happened by your mouth and at your hand? Are you re ready to deeply listen and hold space for those without rebuttal, without, without a comeback? And if she is, or they are, or he is, whoever plays that other side of the equation, if they are, then intimacy and connection in this transformation is absolutely possible. We must learn to honor the other. Hollis and others use the word other I use the word other a lot because it speaks to the ubiquitous nature of the characteristics of being in a relationship. There are more things in common with being in a relationship with a, with a partner and with a child and a friend or a coworker than we can possibly imagine. There are, of course, differences amongst all of those relationships. But as we do this work, we definitely become clear that there is much, much, much more in common than there is different.
<clears throat> Excuse me. Honoring the other and allowing for differences. It is to open the door to freeing self and other to be who each other is meant to be. It is to be open to the possibility of something called love. <clears throat> and on this journey, we have to learn to own our feelings, to own our limitations of self-esteem and self-worth and self-love, to not be begging with our empty cups for the other one to fill it. It's okay to ask for support. That's what partners and friends and important people do in our lives. But there's a difference between asking and demanding. In fact, that difference is, is in many ways, the line between mental health and mental illness. And if we don't own our fear, our anger, our anxiety, our feelings, like I said earlier, we'll project them onto the scapegoat, to the other person, asking them to carry our limitations. And we will call it criticism and resentment. We have to learn to feel and be present, to succumb to the, the, the feelings so that we can resist the urge to try to control the other. Intimacy is terrifying in many ways. It is something that asks us to risk everything, to face and confront our fears of abandonment, our shame, and our being alone. And I didn't used to believe this, but I do now because I know it to be true. I know it from lived experience. Falling in love can be profound when we are allowed to be ourselves in a relationship and who we are is tolerated and even welcomed. I love what Goethe says. He wrote, and so long as you haven't experienced this, to die and so to grow, you are only a troubled guest on the dark earth. I think poets have a way of describing things that are, that are indescribable in this way. So as we come to the conclusion tonight, the choice to stay married, the choice to divorce is not the work. Those choices, those decisions come out of the work. The task that you have is the same either way. And that is to become more conscious. And to do that, you have to learn to love yourself the horrible, rotten parts of yourself, the, the parts of yourself you were told to fear, you were told to get rid of. Marriage is hard and so is divorce. Breaking up is hard and so is staying together. And what I've learned to say to couples is, who are questioning this, my answer is, when they ask, will it be better? Would my life be better? And usually what I say is, it'll be different. Just like if you've chosen a different career or you've chosen not to have children if you have them or if you've chosen to have children if you don't, it will be different. And what you are responsible for is to own the decision and to do the work. The two main projects as I see them in intimacy is number one, to tell the truth, to be who you are and tell the truth about that. To show up as you are as much as you can over and over again. And when you stumble and fall as everybody will does and everybody will do, you pick yourself up back up again, you face the other, you, you apologize, you make your amends, and you try again. And you keep doing that. But the other side of the equation of intimacy might be the harder and more nuanced, more subtle process. And that is to be able to hold the other with love and kindness. But here's the thing, because we are all so injured, because our, we have such fragile egos, such a, a limited supply of self-esteem, we take what others say and think and feel as a threat to our well-being, as a threat to the connection. We take it personal. And then we fight. And then we argue about 
who's the bigger poopy pants. My therapist tells the story of watching her grandson at a birthday party somewhere around the age of five where two of the, the, the little kids were yelling at each other, you're the poopy pants. No, you're the poopy pants. That's what most marital discord is about. But if you come to love and accept and make peace with your horrible, rotten self, you won't need other people to see it as much. You just need, ideally, just one person to see it, to one person to connect to it. And then you know what's left after that that project is accomplished or as it's accomplished because it's a lifelong process until we die? At least I believe it is. I've not arrived yet. Never met anybody who has. What's left after all of that is love. When I am filled up with what I need because I've gone over here and taken care of it and I show up to my wife or to my children, I now have more to give. I now can listen. I don't have to give a rebuttal. I don't have to tell my side of the story. I don't have to talk about how those weren't my intentions. I don't have to criticize them and their limited view of things to make me feel better because I have energy to give. Listeners in this intimacy equation, the listener tends to be the giver. Not always true, but tends to be the giver. And the talker or the one sharing in these intimate relationships tends to be the taker. They're asking to be contained, to be held, to be seen. And on the other side of that, that is, is what is required is a great deal of capacity. But because we all have a narcissistic injury of not being seen, listening replicates the experience we had of not being heard again, right? Because we weren't seen enough in childhood or later, because we weren't seen enough, enough to know ourselves, to really know ourselves. When we are asked to deeply, quietly listen to somebody, it starts to feel like it starts to approximate the wound of not being heard, the wound in childhood that in this scenario we have not healed. So how can you be a better partner? Do your work. Heal your wounds. Take responsibility for your life. Nobody can live it for you. Nobody's coming to save you. Yes, there will be beautiful, magical helpers along the way for sure. No doubt about it. Absolutely. But the work is yours. You will have to do the hardest part of it by a long shot. And if you don't, you'll think that the enemy is out there. You'll think that the problem is in the child, that the child's struggles are the reason for your lack of serenity and peace. That is the lie that you will tell yourself because that's the lie you've, lived up, you've, you've grown up on, that you've been fed your whole life. I always say when somebody tells me that their ex-partner is a narcissist or a borderline, I'll say that's interesting. But what's really fascinating is why are you attracted to a borderline? Why are you attracted to narcissists? That question and its answer are a thrilling, thrilling journey to take. So growing up and growing in, into a relationship will expose all of the in, emotional maturity, all of the undone work, and reveal all of the fractures that were present in the beginning. And that is the invitation of the Eden Project in search of the magical other. I strongly recommend it. Take your time. It's dense. It's got clinical language. But I don't know anything else that says, that, 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 that shows us the story of intimacy, of romantic love, and of its pitfalls more clearly, more courageously. All right, folks. Thanks for joining me. The, the, I'll just wrap up with the upcoming announcements. Uh, the Journey of the Heroic Parent and the Audacity BU My Two Books are available on Amazon and Audible. We have an in-person finding you. We have a spot left in that March 20th through 21st. We have an online uh, option March 8th through 10th, which I talked about at the outset. And then, like I said, we have one spot in the returning to you next week, March 6th through 10th. We have custom finding connection uh, intensives for couples and co-parents and also finding family for families. Just email intensives at evoketherapy.com. We have support groups for current and alumni parents of our wilderness program. 
February 29th is the next offering at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Once a month, we have an alumni only alumni parent meeting um, for, for just our alumni parents. March 18th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time is that offering. And then for our intensives and in coach and coaching clients and alumni, March 11th, 6 p.m. Mountain Time is your support group. You can contact support groups at evoketherapy.com to find out more information. We have coaches that can work with you virtually that understand and have been exposed to this material that can support you on your journey, whether it be working with a child who's struggling or working in a marriage that you're finding, finding yourself difficult or stuck in. We ask all current parents to go to any of the following 12-step support groups. Six is the, one, the, the number that we ask you to try. Alanon.org, Coda.org, FamiliesAnonymous.org, AdultChildren.org, or RefugeRecovery.org. The National Alliance on Mental Illness also has free classes and resources in your local community. Go to NAMI.org to find out more. All these broadcasts are available on Spotify or your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You on Evoke Therapy Podcast wherever you search and consume your podcast. You can also go to SoundCloud.com on your computer and listen there. And Evoke's YouTube channel has the rebroadcast of the video versions of these the next day. You can find Evoke Therapy programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on X, Threads, and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. And you can find Evoke Intensives on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And of course, our blog has wonderful content that says uh, uploaded from our staff who are sharing their own personal journey. All right, folks, I'm going to talk to you in about 48 hours. Any questions you want to send in about this, if there have been any set in tonight, we'll, we'll save those and put those at the top of the queue. You can always email us in between to ask questions, make comments, suggestions to the email address, webinar at evoketherapy.com. And you can also ask for copies of the slides that I use, and I'll fix all the typos that, that were in them tonight. I'll fix all the typos before we send them out. My broadcast for the, for the live question and answer will be two nights from now, um, 48 hours from now, February 29th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. And that'll be for family, friends of our Evoke clients and alumni. I hope this was a helpful point of contact. I hope it made sense. I hope it offered you something. And as always, maybe even more than the other times, for and on behalf of the people that you love and the people that love you, thank you for showing up to places like this and being willing to do your work and look at yourself. It makes all the difference in the world. Have a great evening, folks. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.